good evening uh, for, for some late evening and some very very early morning those who are joining from india and other countries so i am rajendra pratap gupta i am the chairman of dynamic coalition on internet and jobs at the internet governance forum and in this session what we are going to do is talk to you about why do we need internet for all and unveil you the biggest job maps uh, project in history and for that i i must say that as a dynamic coalition we talk of the basics we talk of the things that we need we we cannot talk theoretical you know uh, we need to give real tangible outcome so this project create and uh, the need for internet for all is very important just imagine for a while that if there was no internet with you today how would you feel i think not having internet is bigger than a physical and a mental handicap but still 3 out of 8 people do not have internet that's 2.6 billion last year when i was here at igf in ethiopia it was 2.7 billion this year it's 2.6 that means by this rate will take 25 years to get internet for all i don't think humanity can wait and for today's session i have with me uh, mr gunjan sinha who is joining online he is one of the founders of the first search engine whose where is uh, founded it in 1998 uh he's a legendary figure in this area i have dinu uh, on my right and he serves as the chief information officer at the un joint staff pension fund and leads the un digital transformation group uh he's a revered leader in this space uh, i have connie um, and he uh, sue she was to be here on site but she is unwell she couldn't join online she is the united nations uh, itu's generation connect youth envoy and she works in this area and uh, is a big influencer I also have with me Shona Hoffman, president of Guardrail Technologies on my extreme right. She is uh, responsible AI, blockchain and cyber security subject matter expert. Uh, prior to her current role, uh, she was the chief technology leader of legal strategy at Dell and the leader of Watson AI for law at IBM. So let's welcome then and those are esteemed colleagues who are joined online. So what I'm going to do this in the session is give you a presentation about what's project create. That will give you a sense of why do we need internet for all i mean that's our biggest project that we have launched at igf we announced it last year so i'm going to walk you through the presentation so as you as you see from our uh, our theme is like internet for all to livelihood for all that's that's our overarching theme in project create and the journey uh, that started uh it was 13th uh, igf in paris where i i made the plea that internet should be used to create jobs i don't know if we can play this but you can always go to the website and you know look up it's a very short video and i said we are looking at proliferation of uh, profits a uh, proliferation of technology profits but people are moving out of the center people should be at the center of all we do so this project was a uh, culmination of years of our work starting from 2018 uh 2019 uh, again you know uh, in the igf uh, i made this plea that as igf you know we shouldn't be just looking at big tech i mean any of the panels that you see or hear today you will find metas of the world or the googles nothing wrong i mean they all have to coexist but let's make a choice a subtle choice of small number of large companies versus large number of small companies i think the internet should be governed by large number of small companies not small number of large companies they have a undue influence in one of the reports we have done and you can look up on our website sustainable automation that says that the uh, market cap of this five corporations is equivalent to the gdp of 177 nation you can imagine the amount of clout they you know control command at their health so much um so then this uh, finally we announced on 17 the igf at ethiopia and uh, last year that we are now going to build create as a project so this is a very short video i'm going to play dynamic coalition on internet and jobs we were founded as a result of our efforts in 2018 at igf paris where during the closing remarks i said that proliferation of technology should not be just for productivity and profits it should bring people at the core and i must say that 
I do not know of any organization other than IGF that has 193 countries and thousands of people who attend. I'm given to understand there are 170 plus countries registered in this IGF with 4,000 people. So I think this makes it the most impactful platform on digital technologies and IoT. Now, given the work that we have done over the years, uh, we have produced, we produce our annual report called Internet and Jobs. 2020 we produced, 2021 and 2022 is in the works. Besides that, I want to draw attention to what we heard yesterday that 2.7 billion people are still not connected to the internet. And one of the other things that we have seen in the last month or so is massive layoffs. I think driving back to what Paul Michel recently mentioned, we're going to have a process for tangible outcomes. So today, you know, I'm going to announce a project here and I know that IGF was founded in Africa and this project I'm announcing is about tangible outcomes. This project is called CREATE, which stands for collaborate, to realize employment and entrepreneurship for all through a technology ecosystem. What we want to do is flip the model where we are looking at technology and automation leading to redundancies and job loss. We want to make sure that internet for all should lead to livelihood for all. I think this is where uh, as a dynamic coalition, we want to make sure that when we meet next year in Kyoto, we'll have a blueprint that we should take internet for all and create livelihoods for all so that there are no job losses, rather there should be job creation opportunities. And I'm immensely thankful to Marcus with whom we have worked with the team. And uh, we hope that our work and our reports will lead to achieving our goals. Thank you so much. I was very struck by what was uh, said by Dr. Gupta on uh, this issue of uh, jobs, uh, the opportunity side. Uh, this is an issue that's often neglected in many other discussions. So the dynamic coalition have been able to put the spotlight on issues that have not been sufficiently explored. Uh, and bring them to a level where they start to get noticed. So you heard uh, Amandeep, uh, who is the tech envoy of the UN, who concluded. But we kept our promise. In 10 months, we are unveiling the Project Create Blueprint. And I thank my team for working on this. And the reason we, we had to get into it, you know, it is shocking as humanity that we all had the birth lottery to be sitting in this room and talking about the future of the planet and the so-called internet for all, livelihood for all, but 2.6 billion people don't even have access to internet. So simply because we are lucky doesn't mean we forget those who are not. So I think it's our responsibility to address those issues and talk for them and bring them into this room even while they have no access to the internet. So 2.6 billion people do not have access to internet at all. Uh, there are mass layoffs across the tech industry. And 36% of the least developing, con least developing countries, uh, you know, uh, only 36% of the people use internet compared to 66% globally. And 71% of the people aged 15, 24 use the internet compared to 57 for the rest of the population, 37% for the rest of the population. So what's the need? We need to ensure internet for all to have livelihood for all. That's, that's a clear thing. Uh, that's undebatable. We have to bridge the digital divide by connecting everyone to the internet. And lastly, we have to create a tech-enabled ecosystem to avoid employment and entrepreneurship opportunities to everyone. That's the goal of Project Create. We are very lucky to be mentored by Windsurf, the founder of internet and email, I mean, who is also currently the chief internet evangelist at Google. Mr. Gunjan Sinha has joined us online. He's an internet pioneer executive chairman of Metric Stream, who founded one of the first search engines way back in late 90s. Of course, this is this are the people who actually have inspired the project, and this is the culmination of our discussions that happened with them. Uh, I would say Bernardo Mariano, who is the chief information technology officer and the assistant secretary general of the United Nations. Uh, Mi Michael J. Warren, uh, Amandeep, Anish Chopra, one sitting to my right, Dinu, and of course, uh, Chengetai, who leads IGF. Uh, so been very lucky to be guided by them, inspired by them, and they all took time to discuss this project, give their valuable insights. So you would have seen all this. I don't have to probably show it again, because if you have not seen, you will see them more in the times to come. There'll be more layoffs. I mean, that's, that's a fact, and it is in thousands. So this project, Create, was born. Short video, no sound, I guess. Don't worry about that. 
the whole idea you see is that when you connect internet to anyone what happens in transformation this video encapsulates uh, that journey in the lives of people that it can transform your life This was the plan of the working groups that we formed and the consultations we had in August. Then we had the brainstorming with working group mentors and then job map for sectors, create framework, which you are going to walk in. And then finally, what we're going to do, you know, first time in the world, uh, mid next year, is to create a job summit. See, everyone talks of very high level things of the sustainable development goals. We had first millennium development goals, but no one comes to the bottom line where are the jobs see if there are no middle class people spending money there are no economies let me tell you very clearly the at the end of the day any gdp you talk about any gdp per capita you talk about it's about jobs if you don't have the job you are not in this room so the fact is that end goal of everything we do is to have jobs so we are proposing the first job summit when you say the summit of the future it cannot be summit of the future minus jobs so then you make it parking lots you know you need to create jobs for the future so what are the create principles? A, access and affordable, which is about internet. Then B is about business. Anything that we create, if it is not business, we are just depending on charity or foundation, it's not going to last. C is about community engagement. C is about cooperative-based, individual, or consumption-based. So anything that we create as businesses within Project Create, will be consumption slash transaction based because at the end of the day if the money is not changing hands there is no value creation so one of the beliefs and over studying the economic writing policy is that the value of money lies in how many time it changes hands so the more time it changes hands the more value it creates so it is about business d is about domains and decentralized it cannot be five big tech we have to decentralize technology E is about equitable ecosystem and ethical. So even if you have internet, you can't start selling or doing unethical things. It has to be doing ethical things to create businesses. And then financially viable and financially empowering, both. It should be viable, it should be empowering. It should financially empower individuals and families. Finally, we should generate jobs. At the end, the goal of create is generate jobs. So A to G, these are the principles. The enablers are we need policies. You cannot do anything without that. You need platforms. We'll talk about what platforms that we are talking about. Then you need financial and digital literacy. Ja just having literacy is not enough today. Even if you do digital literacy, if you do not know financial planning, financial management, no one is going to leverage the internet. So finally, what we have realized in Project Create is we need to create financial and digital literacy both. And then ownership. It has to rest with individuals, communities, and cooperatives, not just five big tech. So we have created job maps for nine sectors, which is retail, infrastructure, construction, agriculture, tourism, MSME, GovTech, public goods, health, education, and environment. So these are the nine sectors for which we have created jobs. I'm just going to give you an overarching principle of the uh, job maps and the philosophy of how we create this. And then finally, it give you an example of one sector. I don't think that we have time to discuss all nine sectors, but 12th afternoon from 2 to 3.30, we'll release the report, which is Project Create. It will be available on our website. Uh, this talks in detail about all those sectors. So what's the overarching vision? It's about internet. It's about artificial intelligence. It's about ESG. You cannot have the first two without the last. So we have to be careful about the vision should increase these three if you're looking at creating jobs. It would be much more as we build this. It's going to be dynamic and ever evolving. So I'm going to look at the team. I mean, these are the coordinators, Ashish, Priya, Zan, who used to work with IGF in the past. We have the working groups. And we have questions before that. Let me see. Sorry, I'll have to, uh, Priya, I need to change that presentation to give the roadmap. Just give me a second. Yes, sorry. See, technology always will tell you that we need human intervention. Sorry about that.
So this is the create framework. You know, what has happened is a conventional model, which is centralized, which only looks at existing jobs, which is limited in geography, which is limited in consumer base, which is limited in market, and revenue growth is incremental. That's the conventional framework. What we have done through create framework, we are creating process maps. So there are new jobs, there are decentralized, there are new business opportunities, more value creation, micro entrepreneurs, that's one of the core thrust areas for us. New marketplaces, from market we move to marketplace, then there is expansion of geographical area, increasing consumer base, and revenue generation is exponential, not incremental. So there is a decentralization and there is a multiplier effect. That is what this creates, and we have examples right now, you can see it, you know, how these have people have created. And let me show you the other slide of how we have ended up creating the job maps for two sectors at least. So this is the conventional retail, which is a food industry. So if you look at that, the conventional business model, you have one, uh, what you call an entity. You have maybe three or four employees because that was you can afford. And you have limited consumer base. So you have limited geography, you have limited consumer base, you have limited jobs, centralized, revenue growth is incremental at max. I mean, you can be 1x, 2x, 3x, or 10x. What happens in this is very different. I mean, when you look at this model, you create more. So there is, I'll give an example, like it took a restaurant business. I have a restaurant. I will have a clerk who will take the orders. I'll have cooks who will have chefs. We'll have delivery boys, that's all and I'll serve a limited geography. The moment you move it to a platform, you dinsize under create model. So I do not have a restaurant. I just have a kitchen. I can log onto a platform and serve people much beyond my geography. So I end up creating micro entrepreneurs. I can have cloud kitchens. So we have done this for all sectors. I mean, we have done it for retail. So we also create a lot of new jobs because there you had only chefs, you only had delivery boys, you only had cooks. But here you would have web designers, you will have digital marketing people, you will have UX AI. So you will have people who are training, you will require skilling also. So I think uh, upscaling and upscaling go all together and you create a multiplier effect in terms of jobs and in terms of businesses. So finally, this brings me back to my uh, last slide of two questions that we need to answer. Because if you really want to leverage the full potential, you cannot do that without two things. Can internet for all become a reality? That's one question. And the second, what are the suggestions of my panelists to make it happen? So now I will move to uh, Gunjan Sena if he has joined. Gunjan, are you online? I, I'm online. Gunjan, uh, good evening. So Thanks. you have Welcome been a pioneer. Time. You have been a pioneer in this space. You know, you dreamt of an internet when I think websites were just showing up and you created a phenomenal opportunity for the world to look at, which we have, I think, where the world looked at it. But do you think still, given that 2.6 billion people are not connected to the internet, is it a realistic dream to have that we can have internet for all, not in 25 years as the numbers and the growth show us, but maybe in the immediate future, maybe in the next five to seven years? And what are the business models to make it happen? <coughs> Thank you, Professor Gupta. Really appreciate uh uh, the conversation here, and I really enjoyed kind of your introductory slides on the project create. I think it lends a lot of topics on the footset on the forefront for the kinds of things that we all should be discussing in this platform, given you know the fortunate uh, fortune that we have of enjoying the internet, having the connectivity, and including those that don't. I think the staggering numbers of over two and a half billion people who are not included into the internet revolution, even 25 years after its creation is something that should be on all of our minds. And I think I appreciate you to kind of put that on the table. So uh, I just wanted to put some remarks here that I, as I look at it and I, uh, internet has, is going through a revolution and an evolution, you know, with the advent of AI, you know, this year, last year, as you have seen the chat GPT come together it's actually accelerating its potential and it can work both ways if we are not being responsible how we think about it. And I talk about that, you know, AI it should not be creating billions for few, rather AI should generate jobs for billions of people. 
So I call it AI for billions, you know, and this is the choice that we have to make as a civic society, as, as governments, and as, as uh, think tanks and associations and organizations who care about ESG, who care about social responsibility, and who care about the future of work and jobs and digital literacy. These are important things, not just to put on the map or put on your vocabulary, but it's also important because this is how you build a society which reduces the digital divide and puts a framework that is absolutely gonna build a sustainable value for all. So I have few recommendations and thoughts here. First and foremost, an organization like the coalition that we are part of here and discussing, we have to be action oriented. And, uh, and Professor Gupta, I applaud you for taking the leadership and being action oriented. And I urge all of us to you know, think in the, exactly the same way. So we have to be action oriented. In particular, internet and the AI lends itself very well to spread what I call digital literacy. Digital literacy in a way that creates more upskilling and reskilling, especially as the job markets will evolve into the future. So I, I really appreciate the blueprints, the job maps, because it lays out a foundation of what by vertical is possible, where can jobs be created, and it gives a blueprint to individuals to reskill themselves, but also to small startups and small businesses and corporations to participate in the literacy and upskilling uh, direction. So that's, I think, is a point of leverage and should be considered very seriously. The second topic, which I think is extremely important, is we need to learn from the large global big techs. There's a reason why they equal the GDP of 150 plus countries. I think that's a staggering number. And I have seen, you know, why they have assembled such a mass is they have gotten into the psychology of the internet users, and much of that has been used to profit few corporations. And again, there's nothing wrong in that. You know, profit generation is absolutely a okay motive. But if we want to counter that with creating large numbers of small companies, I think we have to take the profit discussion to saying where can we drive impact and job creation. And one of the tools that they have used is they have understood the psychology of the users, that users are getting addicted and I'm gonna use the word addiction, they're getting addicted to the internet, chasing things that you know, were not designed to be chased in the way that it's actually happening. So a good example of that is social media. All of us know how large populations of people care about the likes on Facebook or the latest posts, and each of them have implications in terms of its uh, digital impact, it, the amount of time it takes away, and ultimately does not, with besides some minor entertainment value, does not create significant job value. But if we took the same concept of how they have made internet addicted to your iPhone, to your social media, to your Instagram, to your TikTok, and everything else that is hitting our young generation, we should be thinking about how to make learning addictive. How do we make digital, uh, digital literacy addictive? You know, so let's use what has worked for these large behemoth companies to our advantage. And there's nothing about, you know, feeling that they did something wrong. To me, it's let's take the tool and make sure that we make learning and job creation addictive. Because what happens is this modern generation of a millennials, the younger generation, that's what they are tuned to. So as we make learning more instant, more mobile, one question at a time, one concept at a time, maybe they'll become a graphics designer, maybe they'll become uh, you know, workforce of the future, maybe they can freelance onto a digital platform that we are defining in a job map. So I come back at saying there's an immense opportunity at this inflection point where AI and internet are here today. Let's really focus our energy on digital literacy of all sorts, end to end, including financial literacy, because there's no literacy without financial literacy. You cover the entire gamut and let's make learning addictive. And if you do that well, you would have shown your social responsibility, you've shown your ESG, you've shown your uh, care for the two and a half billion people who don't exist today, because many of those people will start to figure out ways in participating in reskilling and upskilling themselves and participating into the job maps across the industries that we're laying out here. So that's, those are the two key points I wanted to emphasize. 
you know, uh, Professor Gupta, I, and I'm not sure if uh, uh, that resonates with your uh, worldview, but I would love to kind of put that on the table. Thanks, Gunjan. In fact, uh, you have been a constant uh, companion in this journey for uh, Project Create, and I think uh, had benefited immensely out of the discussions uh, we had with you. So totally agree with you. In fact, I'll just uh, relate to you. Today morning while I was uh, coming to the uh, conference center, I was telling my colleague, when you look at everyone in the train was on their mobile phones, almost everyone, bearing maybe 2 or 3%. Uh, not a great thing to do, but if you really look at what they're doing, they're playing games. Most of them, they're playing, you know, they're watching videos, TikToks and uh, others. So I was telling my colleague, you know, which is reflective of one side, the addiction, the other side of the frustrations people have in their mind from the routine they're in. Means that what they're doing, they're forced to be doing. So they find mobile as a vent to just do some things which kind of are stress busters. So, but if we can channelize that energies into what Gunjan, you are saying is make learning addictive. And if we can do that financial, financial and digital literacy, I think we are game. We have actually hit people. And I still believe that these 2.6 billion people coming in the fold of internet, it's not that internet would benefit just, I mean, I think these people will add at least one third to the current existing economy of the world, which probably is around probably, you know, yeah. hundred of plus trillion dollars. So I think that would be a phenomenal opportunity for the world. I mean, it's not about internet for all. It's also economy for all. I mean, yeah. I, I can see the impact of, you know, if Project Create, which I believe is one of the world's biggest project for jobs, it'll be one of the biggest projects for uplifting the economies because we've still left out many people. Now, this brings me to my colleague, Dinu, who has also got UN Secretary General Award for his innovations. Uh, phenomenal thinker and innovator and a doer. I think what Gunjan, you brought out in the beginning that we have to get into action. Dinu is one person who demonstrates through his work phenomenal action that he has over the years done to impact, and this is all about technology. So Dino, what do you feel about the topic that we are on, and what are the ideas that you think that we should chase as our goals when we come back next year to IGF? I guess it's going to be Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, what do you, what is, what's your view? Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta, for inviting me and uh, contributing to this uh, very important initiative. So, it's a, it's a privilege and honor for me to be part of this conversation. Thank you also for the kind introduction. And indeed, uh, I really appreciate when, uh, whenever someone makes reference to myself as to uh, what I've done. I'm a very practical person. I'm a doer, so to speak, and I like to introduce myself in that way. Uh, so. In this context, uh, I definitely uh, agree with uh, the point and the observation, the distinction that uh, Gunjan uh, elaborated on uh, before me. But I would like to take a step back. And uh, I think that before we start thinking about the risk and the benefit that can derive from uh, the use of these technologies, I think that we need to ask ourselves, as you uh, critically uh, identify in your, in your project, the point of accessibility. Because if someone cannot access the internet, if someone cannot access the technologies and the applications that are built on top of the internet, they cannot even have the problem, even much less, of course, the, the benefit. So, um, and my perspective here, uh, going back to my practical experience, is that we definitely have, for convenience purposes in our uh, conversation, we talk about internet, we're talking about AI, we're talking about blockchain, but ultimately we're talking about a system that is ever-changing. And the protocols and the technologies and the processes that are built on top of this infrastructure are enriching and creating this possibility. So because of my personal experience, I, I would like to talk a little bit more about blockchain specifically because blockchain was the technology that I've used to create a digital identity for the United Nations Joint Staff Pension Fund and that in turn created that accessibility to digital services that before were not imaginable, were not available. In my specific case, were very subset group of people where the pension 
pensioners and retirees of the United Nations. We're talking about 84,000 people residing in 192 countries. So from the perspective of the blockchain as this piece, as a, this example of a ever changing and growing platform and, and uh, technologies, I think that blockchain demonstrated that this technology, first and foremost, can enable individual to have a digital identity and therefore be recognized. So as we talk about having access, in order to have access, you need to be recognized. You need to be acknowledged in a way that is secure, that is trustworthy. And uh, so from my point of view, and definitely I'm biased because my, uh, my product or my, my application, my solution was about digital identity. Immediately after that is about affordability. And here I think there are recently excellent example of how blockchain has been utilized to create wireless, decentralized wireless network. One example is the Helium.com initiative that basically enable individual that there are in remote parts of the world where maybe, as we were talking, as uh, you uh, clearly alluded to before, maybe big corporation, a telecom, will not have that interest. They will not have that incentive to create profit. That technology can enable, by using uh, advanced uh, mechanisms, such as the proof of coverage, new terminology that uh, comes into the fore, to make the accessibility a reality for many people. We can talk about also the mesh network that can allow people to share access and therefore not having to uh, incur the cost with getting access to the internet. We can talk about payments. And again, I'm speaking from my personal example. The United Nations cannot stop sending funds around the world in order to pursue its mission. But we also know that especially in the recent past, we have cases where countries have been embargoed in the international payment system. The example of Afghanistan, the example of Sudan, the example of Ukraine. So how can you continue to operate worldwide and ensure that the payment reach the individual that the innocent people that maybe are not part of the conflict, that do not have a direct stake on it, but still they are negatively impacted. And again, technology such as blockchain can enable traceability, can enable the transfer of funds in a secure manner across the globe. And then there is, of course, associated with all of this, the issue of security, the issue of privacy, and also the ability that once you put together all these component element, you are able to create decentralized new marketplaces. Going back to uh, your goals, the fact that people can and should be enabled to create a new opportunities for job, new opportunities for work that they were not available in the recent past. So if I may conclude, and I'm going to use the word of Scott Storneda, the father of the blockchain that uh, me and Shwana had the honor and privilege to meet and discuss that we are part of the Government Blockchain Association with Sto uh, uh, Scott is often a speaker. He presented the blockchain not just as a technology advancement, but as a new form of social contract. How a technology, if used well, if used with the proper guardrails, with the proper control, can really create a new avenues for people to work and prosper. Thank you. Thanks, Dinu. I have a follow-up question on that. So when we talk of artificial intelligence, should we now start talking AI and blockchain together? That makes more sense? Absolutely, a and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I didn't want to take too much of the time. This is a, it's a wonderful topic, and definitely we have a subject matter expert here with us, with Shawana. I would just say this. I think, again, we should not look at this new emerging technology in isolation but we should look at them as part of a system, of ecosystem, where they can complement each other. AI is a probabilistic technology. Blockchain is deterministic technology. If we put the two together, we can make sure, as, as it's being discussed and continuously uh, uh, um, raise the, the risk of using AI, we can use blockchain, for example, to be a trustworthy source of data that then can be fed to AI model and be reliable on the result of the AI model. Because the concept of hallucination, 
the concept of misuse, the concept of misinformation and the deep fakes comes from the fact that, that these models are, if I may use the term, misused because either intentionally or unintentionally they utilize incorrect data. By putting the two things together, if we rely on the value proposition of blockchain, the, which is the producing immutable data that has been verified, validated through consensus mechanism, we can feed AI model the right information and therefore expect the right result and outcome. Thanks, Zinu. As I, as I get from the discussion, it's on one side you have probabilistic AI and then you have deterministic blockchain. So AI unless denominated by blockchain is not going to create trust. Rather it's bound for misuse. Is it true? It's a risk. It's definitely a risk, risk and I therefore I think that uh, we can use the two technologies together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to provide, to mitigate that risk. Absolutely. So I think it's clear that if you have to create jobs, it is AI plus blockchain, not alone. True. Exactly. I totally yes. agree with that statement. Thanks. So now we have uh, Connie Man uh, Hai Su. She is the United Nations International Telecommunication Union's uh, Youth Envoy. And uh, if we talk of the internet we want, I think the best people to comment is the uh, community of youth. So Connie would want your views on is internet for all a realistic dream and what are the models to take internet for all? Over to you. Hi, thank you, Professor Gupta. Am I am I audible? Okay, perfect. So I think that regarding the question on whether internet for all is realistic or not, just from a view of like a very young person, um, I think it's very, very double-sided because there are obviously a lot of still many barriers. There's a lot of challenges. For example, one very glaring challenge is definitely the digital divide because like in some parts of the world where I'm from, Hong Kong, there's high-speed internet. It's already readily accessible, while in other countries, it's still a very distant dream. So this divide definitely perpetuates disparities in many different aspects like in education, job opportunities, and access to information. And in another sense is technological advancement. So if we think about it positively, technology has been advancing at a very incredible pace. Like a, a speaker has already mentioned, there are many new emerging technologies and, and all that. And these have the potential to bring connectivity to remote areas. So if we consider these, then yes, internet for all is definitely something that we could potentially reach because if these breakthroughs, uh, dream of this universal uh, internet access becomes more achievable. And uh, being a part of uh, the United Nations ITU, we can see that many different international organizations and also some governments, they're also increasingly recognizing the importance of having connectivity for everyone. So there are many different initiatives like um, the biggest one, like UN SDGs, they aim to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in these developed countries. And this further promotes other organizations, other uh, governments to take action. And so with this in mind, I think this creates some sort of ripple effect and this would definitely help with uh, achieving this, this goal of having internet for everyone. And, uh, also, from the perspective of young people, there are many young people definitely taking different solutions, different initiatives to uh, take these community-driven initiatives. So there are many youth-led organizations, there are projects that are actively working to create local regional networks and also provide low-cost devices. And so even these grassroots efforts, they, they make a very huge difference. So if we take this into consideration, then it's also a very nice step towards uh, this goal. And uh, another aspect would be economical consideration. So the, this, this could be a barrier, this could be like a boost because the economic argument for universal internet access is pretty strong. So connectivity boosts productivity. It, fosters entrepreneurship, it also drives economic growth. And this makes it not only like a more imperative, but it's also a very smart investment for governments and businesses. And there are also different challenges. Like I've, I've mentioned, there are 
that there are many opportunities, but there are also many different challenges. For example, there's infrastructure development, there's affordability and ensuring cybersecurity, uh, data privacy. These are all very complex issues and they require a lot of effort, they require a lot of resources. So whether or not different stakeholders can come together and be willing to work with each other to solve these issues will be something that could potentially be a barrier towards achieving this goal. But then I believe that a lot of people, especially young people, we are very passionate about these issues and we are definitely at the forefront of trying to make change, trying to voice our thoughts on these issues. And I believe that our energy, our passion, and also our like innovative ideas can definitely drive this sort of agenda towards uh, universal internet access. So I think that's all from me now. Over to you. Thanks, Connie. So let me move to Shauna. Shauna, you have been involved with uh, what you will call pioneering technology, you know, and uh, projects which were of global scale, IBM Watson and all. We are talking of a project of this scale, probably much bigger. We're talking of job, literally livelihood for all. Do you think internet for all is a realistic dream? And can we really have a situation where there is livelihood for all? Are there models that you would suggest that we should look at? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Gupta. And uh, Dino, it's always a pleasure to share the stage with you and to speak with those um, who are here today who all have the same hearts as we do. And as we, your question is, you know, is the internet uh, for all realistic? I, s I actually believe it has to be. If we think about where we want the world to be in the next decade, we are all striving in the end for equality. And diversity and inclusion, I know, is uh, top foremost um, as one of the most important SDGs as, as it really does align with so many of them out there. So as we start to think about what is that world what needs to change in the world to make that happen? It's interesting to me to really look at what happened during COVID-19. We saw a lot of job displacement during that time. You know, often changes occur when we are the most uncomfortable and sometimes forced to make that happen. And so I do think that we have a really good opportunity to look at the statistics during that time and see what we need to do as the world to bring the internet and other advanced technologies to, um, to you know, individuals across the globe. Now, job displacement you know, due to economic downturns, of course, caused by COVID-19, can have a long-lasting negative consequence for individuals and society as a whole. And unfortunately, not everyone who is displaced is able to find a new job in a timely fashion, um, leading to long-term unemployment, reduced earnings, and inc you know, increased inequality. Um, but there's great opportunities to actually, what, at least what, what the perspective that I've been seeing is, there's a great report that came out by McKinsey and Company, and um, as many as 375 million people will be required to switch job categories entirely. And that is due to automation within the industries and, of course, more advanced technologies. This gives us a great opportunity because we have such a disruption, such a force for change to really bring out the Internet to more people and help even the playing field for all. We saw this during COVID-19 with freelancing and the gig economy. Platforms like Upwork have allowed individuals to find freelance and work online, contributing to the gig economy. Um, a McKinsey report stated that about 20 to 30 percent of the workforce in the United Nations, or sorry, in the United States and the European Union engaged in independent work at that time. I have um, been supporting an orphanage in Kenya for a while, and it was amazing to see the students that were that were orphans and now, are, of course, are at a high school in locally in Kenya, and they were all using their phones and reaching out to many of us in the United States, asking how they can create their online stores. Many of them have created online stores, are being able to not only trade and um, you know make financial gain locally, but also worldwide. You know, there are many amazing opportunities and amazing things that we have purchased from others across the globe uh, due to the advancements in technology and the internet being connected to everyone. Uh, I was surprised uh, recently, I've um, been to some of the uh, more challenged areas of the world, 
and everyone had cell phones that I saw. And I think that we are doing a great job to make sure that there is mobile access for many, but increasing that even further is going to be important. In the United States, uh, I founded a homeless services program. We've helped over 100,000 people get um, from, you know, uh, I guess homeless to homes. And part of that process is making sure that they have access to the internet and access to uh, advanced technology. We provide centers for them, but then more importantly, because of a program we have at the U.S. government, it allows them to have free mobile phones. Many of them we've set up with remote work, which was something, you know, even a decade or two ago that you didn't have an opportunity to have access to. So that remote work has been uh, amazing uh, and a great opportunity. Uh, in regards to the tech startups, too, I have a tech startup myself, and like many companies, you know, we have a headquarters, but it's a small office because we can work all over the globe. And it really allows us to put locations in some of the areas that we may not have been able to do in the past. And um, the online education, too, I think I will kind of mention one last thing personally. I finished my degree at Harvard uh, during, <laughs> during the pandemic, and it was because of the online education I was able to do that. So I'm very appreciative to be able to have my phone in my pocket when my computer wouldn't work, which happened. Unfortunately, often I was able to go on, write my papers, submit those, and, um, you know, and do things that I never could have before. So do I believe that we need internet for all? Absolutely. And I think we need to figure out what we can do to help push push nations to support their citizens in having the internet access to the internet and access to their requirements like mo mobile phones or computers that they would need to get access. Thank you. Thanks, Shauna. Very interesting. So as, as a session, as a dynamic coalition, all of us have a goal. I think in this particular session, what we want to do is uh, try to get closer to finding an answer of how do we take internet for all the reality? How does the business of that work? So yesterday I had a very interesting gentleman who walked to our booth and talked about having eyes was not able to see. I think there was also like having an idea not able to speak. So Dinesh, the mic is yours. You can share your ideas of what you come across. You have a mic out there. You can just give your points on the topic that we're discussing, internet for all. I think the point that Dinu and Shauna actually brought is one of our first principle called access. And I think what you talked about was access. So what according to you with the work you do, give a brief about your work and maybe three minutes about yeah. what we um, need to do. We are a small group. Uh, mostly we call ourselves a rural research lab. And we live in a rural area and we work on the ground. Uh, but my background is computer science. I'm a PhD. I came from Palo Alto to India 20 years ago. And uh, ever since, I've been looking at the problem of access in various kinds. But as years go by, we realize the idea of content access has not progressed. You know, we just give up when it comes to there are you're talking about 2.6 billion who don't have internet access. There are maybe 3.5 or more billion, including the 2.6, who cannot read and what comes on the web. Like a simple um, uh, test is you ask them to search something on the web, see how, what kind of keywords they can use, and s and the results that come out, see what they can do with it. It's just not a space that you know it's available. It's accessible for many. So what do we do about content accessibility? Why are we giving up? We are all technical, we can do AI, we can do all kinds of things, but we don't want to see the people who uh, are just walking all around us, but cannot read and write. So we call them, like I've been part of the W3C India Accessibility Working Group, but they only want to copy paste European accessibility guidelines. But in India, there are one billion people who are different than the Europe, right? So we need to look at what we can do to reach technically, technologically, internet, extend the internet to the low literates. And we have a lot of ways to do it, but your mind has to kind of focus on them. So um, 
I can tell you more about what we are doing. One of the approaches is called web annotation. If you ha have a website, Government of India has a website on Minimum Wages Act, who is it relevant to if you're not getting minimum wage? Most of them can't read and write, right? So how do you share this act with somebody who cannot read and write? So web annotation is a simple process. When you share, you highlight something, just like they're sitting next to you, and say something about that paragraph that's relevant to them. So it's the way, same website, but it keeps on collecting more and more narratives by different people. And you can do many things with it. Okay. So that's one way, and uh, that's called web annotation. The ground up we are doing is, like you're talking about, we have a, a mesh network called CowMesh, community-owned network, Wi-Fi mesh network, Cow. So within this, we are looking at services, and uh, what does services mean? First is a decentralized server. It collects all the stories anybody has. It doesn't ask you to read and write. All verbal, visual, photos, and all those things. And anybody, now, you have the text internet. You have hyperlinks, hypertext. What is the equivalent for this collection of uh, media repositories? Okay, this is the critical thing, right? Every listener can annotate a fragment when they're listening. What can these annotations be? Okay. It could be a photograph. It could be something that they want to say about it. it. They could tag somebody. And what it's doing is effectively creating hypermedia amongst this. Okay. Now this third problem is how do you connect the textual web to these things? Okay, so, and that becomes the whole decentralized internet space. Okay, it can exist on the net, but most of the decentralized spaces are very specific. They have their own dialect, you know, but you're, they're made to talk and listen to people who are publishing for the anonymous somebody, not for their neighbors. And now we are bringing this together, and s we need to see whether it's this way or another way, we need to focus on content accessibility for all, okay, and it's possible. We just need to see that there are more than half the number of people on the earth who belong in this thing. Thank you, Danish. Thank you for the wonderful work you're doing, and uh, we'll do you know what we can do to support uh, the work that you're doing and to spread it, because as of today, you know, we are searching for solutions but there are solutions that are existing in silos. I mean, these are islands of excellence. We need to make them centers of excellence. That's one of the biggest challenge, you know, is that one keeps doing good work, but it doesn't, you know, grow. I mean, people don't connect there. So one of the things we have to do is that. So even the roadmaps that we have created, the job maps that we have created, we have actually researched what's being done. Can we take that and apply to other sectors? Of course, then we had the you know, legends talking to who had, you know, disrupted sectors, they think exponentially. So then we arrived at job map. So one of the things, you know, that I want to throw open to people, and this is what we want from you, I think we want to spend maximum time discussing with you. When we come out with the outcomes report of this session, we should have at least given few fundamentals out. Like, you know, first is absolutely clear that we need to work as an ecosystem. This is not about technology, it's about people. You know, that's, that's a fundamental thing. It's not about productivity and profits. It's again back to people. I mean, if you have people at the center, you still make things happen. Project Create is all about that. You cannot use technology to have floor efficiencies. You need to create more floors. You need to create more jobs. And that's exactly what we figure out we can do. So rather than a centralized system, it is decentralized. But everything is about internet. So that site we can't lose out. I mean, it is still too criminal as a humanity to not have 2.6 billion people on the net. I mean, they're still in dark age in real sense. That's the biggest handicap, one which is not counted, which is not reported as a handicap. You know, Today we are talking, you could come here because you could register. If you don't register on IGF, you don't come here. It's internet. 
So let's take that challenge that by next year, how many people we will be able through policies because see at the end of the day, this is a wonderful platform as IGF. This is the UN's body for internet related issues. If we can't make them a recommendation, we would be still talking esoteric things that inclusiveness, equity. I mean, this has no definition. I mean, the real definition is job. That's about economy. So I have been thinking and I want to bounce it off to you and then, you know, make one of the recommendations if all agree that today when you sit on a Starbucks or any coffee shop, you get free internet thanks to that business. You go to an airport, you log on, you get an internet, say for 40 minutes, for one hour, for four hours, sponsored, you have to see an ad for 17 seconds, it's pretty good. I mean, I get four hours of internet access. So if we have such business model, what stops us from providing those business models to those 2.6 billion people at the end of the day are also consumers they are consuming your fast moving consumer goods they are going to consume more they are going to do more so what stops us from using a wonderful uh, model that india has called usof it's the universal service obligation fund so when you apply for a telecom license you pay a fee a part of that goes to usof which is used for funding rural telephony so can globally we not have through isps a uh, fund like usof so that you know part of your license fees is for funding those 2.6 billion. That's one recommendation. I mean, if you really look at the um, turnover of those large ISPs or telecom providers, it runs into tens of billions of dollars. I think what we need is a fraction of that to fund those 2.6 billion. Even with 2G, forget 4G and 5G, and just with 2G, start somewhere. And you know, whatever networks you're talking about, that's one. Second is, there are companies like levers that operate all over the world. There are tech companies that want everyone to use Facebook. I mean, I see on high level panel always people from metas of the world to Google, so sitting with prime ministers, giving speeches, talking about AI. <laughs> the basic intelligence is not there. I mean, we don't have 2G in the, you know, one third of the world. So can't we not have a part of them giving ads? I'm not saying give charity. There's no charity we are talking here. So if people can spend on ads and, you know, subsidize the internet for those 2.6 billion, not subsidized, actually make money at the end of the day. They buy their product. So if we can have advertising as a means of providing internet, can that model not work to give internet to 2.6 billion people? I mean, I throw that open. I mean, are there views or better models for us to replicate? I mean, it's open to my panelists online. Dinesh, to you, I think you are on the line. Um, I want to say, like, when you uh, work with Wi-Fi mesh networks, this is a problem of a different kind. Okay, The mesh network is for the locality. They have high speed connection with each other, not 2G, 3G. What do they do on the internet is the question. Okay, But if it's a mesh network that's providing, let's say a local, you are part of the rural area and you want to give an ad. Imagine that, right? It's your community, people, micro entrepreneurs saying like, hey, I got a gig, can you guys come? Let's b come together and solve a problem, okay? Or you have another make maker something and you are announcing it. Okay. You have to think of proxima proximality of the area and how Wi-Fi mesh works. And then a lot of your uh, thinking and what you're watching and who you are um, uh, reading about is your locals. One of the amazing examples we have is the women in the area, patriarchal societies. They are hurt, but there's no trust networking for them. Where is the trust networking? It's very, very important for them to have a trust network. They can't go out to their neighbors because the men are watching. Neighbor, neighbor women to talk about the issue. Where is the trust network? You know, we have to think like that, right? And Wi-Fi mesh or local mesh is the first answer. They have lot less to do with something that's going on in Delhi. Like we, we did an experiment of draw your map of the country. Delhi will be like far away, right? One long line. We don't know what's happening there. Even if Bangalore is as far away, because they come for jobs and all those things, it's like one train, small right, train right away. You know, this is how people think. So we need to kind of see what is the significance of community networks 
and services that go with them and enable everybody as first class citizens on the internet, right? First class citizens on the internet. I'll take one more minute. This is the first time in human evolution that you, we all have, including the low literates, a possibility to self-publish. You just press a button, forward it or save it. Forward it to somebody across in the world or save it for future. If you didn't have it, you can go through the history. Suppose we all believe in this amazing good book called Bible. What do we do? The king will say, let's spread this. And then comes the institution of churches, just to repeat this book. We have come from there to here. Everything is a power game after that, an institution or something, right? Now we can all publish our own Bibles. The first time we can talk about human equality, not just rights. Everybody's right is to be equal in terms of expressiveness, freedom of expression. Thanks, Manish. Uh, you know, this is what is the fundamental reason why we are championing this one line, internet for all. There's still one or three don't have it. And we still are, you know, just, we are still talking about it. I mean, there is no, no such thing that I see as a plan. But if we come out with a business model, one is to smash network, fantastic. I mean, we will include the community because that's what we are saying, that our principles talk about community, cooperative. You know, this is, and then there has to be a consumption. So it's about that. But what are the models that we can recommend? You know, that if we go to someone, they say it's a win-win for all. At the end of the day, see, today we are living in a materialistic world. Yeah. yeah. So if, yeah. If multiple things can ride, like I give an example because not India because I come from because it's a huge country, 1.4 billion. We have a 250,000 centers called panchayats, which is the local village communities. We have equal number of post offices. So if we can create a web network, why only private sector advertise it? GovTech, you know, we have common service centers where you get government services. Create that into a business model. People pay a small fees, take the service, they get a job. They create that business model. It's already existing in India. We have to create more such thing. Why should a government office be only open nine to five? Why can't you at your home become a government agent? The government gives a service, you add a surcharge. So people get at the convenience, they don't have to go during office hours. They can go on a weekend, avail the service, pay a charge, so you become entrepreneur. So the possibilities are immense, but net is the overarching thing. If there's no internet, you are not there. So can there be a business model where Okay, governments which have got revenues coming from telecom say, will definitely provide to those one third of the people who don't have. Then you have, yeah. And then you have private sector which has got products in that area to say, okay, we will advertise a portion. I mean, if they take what we call self-regulation, in India we made a rule called corporate social responsibility. So if there is self-regulation, they say 20% of our reven advertisement revenues or budgets will actually go to rural areas, underserved areas for this, which you have, which you have identified, identified. Otherwise, sustainable development goals, like million development goals, will be repeated into some more development goals after that time comes to an end. But we need to get into the yearly measurement of target. I mean, I think those 2.7 to 2.6 billion is a shocker for me. In one year, this is all we have achieved. Last year, the number was 2.7 billion, not on the internet, this time is 2.6. So I think in our life, it will not happen. We can't do that. Sitting in the room, we can't do that. So is this a model to look at? Are there other models? I mean, it is open. I think Dinu to you, um, Gunjan to you online. Uh, you want to share something on the models because you, you yeah. looked at internet at a time when uh, people didn't even own a website. You built probably the first website for Red Cross, if I'm right, uh, Gunjan? Yeah. So share yes. what, what is the new, new thing that we can build for people to have internet? Yeah, <coughs> and... and uh, Professor Gupta, I think the, the part I think that you're highlighting, I kind of look at the world, you know, think of it as X and Y access. On one axis is accessibility, which is, you know, the concept of, you know, the USOF and how does that actually can be through a sustainable business model, extend the internet to the 2.5 billion people who don't have access. That's kind of, let's think of that as X axis. 
But on the y-axis, I want to bring up some of the points that Shana brought up. You know, 375 million people, the McKinsey report that talks about that they will have to find new skills, new categories. You know, they, the, the, the freelance platforms, the marketplaces like Ubers, DoorDash, Swiggies, everything, all of that is already underway. The new technologies like the AI and blockchain are here and they will build, you know, entrepreneurs will build what I call overall fair, uh, trusted networks over time. The fundamental thing that we have to learn from of the last 25, 30 years of the internet history is how do we actually turn internet as a platform for what I would call making it addictive for good, for literacy, for, you know, reskilling. So Shana, when you said you went to Harvard, there is very few people in the world who can say that and they don't need to go to Harvard, but if they can get bite-sized learning on the fly, on the train that you know uh, that you were talking about, Dr. Professor Gupta, where people can actually learn bite-sized little things. You know, we talked about digital literacy, we talked about content accessibility, the annotation. I think the learning is needs to be disrupted. This is not going to get disrupted by the Facebooks and the Metas and the Apples of the world because they are harnessing the power of that addictability for advertising revenues for the business models and so forth. But at scale, if we reinvent the university, the old school university to the modern day learning, which becomes addictive at scale to billion plus people, suddenly you have now turned AI and blockchain and all the modern technology into an opportunity for the masses, as opposed to what I call for select few who know the power of it. So I think to me, I come back, there is a need for what I would call, you know, understanding what makes internet addictive, what makes it more uh, engaging so that common people get addicted to good causes like learning, not just having likes and you know sh uh, show-offs and photographs and things that are entertaining, which I love the entertainment part of the internet, you know, but I think we need to move away from just that, but also layer in us educational component, but it has to be gamified, it has to be and uh, entertaining in that way, but where people become addicted to learning, and that is how you reskill them and prepare them for the next set of freelance jobs, next set of you know virtual employment. And I think then people in Kenya to to United States to India to around the world will be in a very different place. And I think that's what I am right now thinking about. I'm trying to imagine how do I make internet more addictive, more gamified, but for good for learning, so that everybody can get their so-called Harvard degrees without even going to Harvard. Shana, over to you. Sorry, we're I putting mean, on a spot. Thank you so much. No, that is very, very well said. And I am such a proponent of education. I think daily I spend so much time even listening for myself to YouTube videos that are educational. And, you know, I spend 10 to 15 minutes a day doing things that are not Harvard, they're not, you know, Ivy League, but instead listening to real world stories. So I do think there's a great opportunity for us to use the advancements in artificial intelligence also, just to kind of uh, add on to what you were saying here, to make people excited about education and I also think that it can even the playing field for those who are, um, you know, don't have an opportunity to learn the way that many of us did. The yep. literacy is ju oh, it just hurts my heart. And no, but Shana, this is, yeah. yeah, this is exactly what's on my mind here that AI can start serving yes. very personalized, engaging. So I would know exactly what needs to be served to you versus, yes. you know, somebody else. At the moment in time where I know you're sitting on a train going from point A to point B. So the intelligence that would come about in this modern world of I'm going to hook you up with education, with, with, with enlightenment about new spaces. And that, I think, becomes the paradigm, just like what Facebook did, just like what Apple did and Google did. Can you apply that at scale? So it's what I call mass literacy at scale, which is addictive, gamified, and you cannot get your eyes off that because you want to hear that podcast from somebody who gave a beautiful TED talk or somebody who, you know, but that content accessibility, which we talked about is still, you know, part of privileges of few, few who are motivated, few who know how to access this, but AI can now start serving it in bite sizes to large scale population. I think 
that's a game changer in my mind. And that's what on my, you know, that's what I think we need to and think about how can we make it actionable in some ways at a platform like this. So that that's going to create um, you know, millions, if not billions of jobs, because I think the reskilling has to happen. AI is going to be dislocating a lot of things over the next 10 years. I would agree. And I think one of um, the most amazing opportunities for us is also video and audio. And I think, you know, our guest yeah. speaker here, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, AI can automatically create videos and audio from anything. And so if someone cannot read and videos is a good connection for them, or even if there's a disability, they need audio in a very different way. AI can really transform into what that individual needs um, and hopefully has learned how to serve it up to the individual. What are your thoughts on that? So um, we work with traditional storytellers, nomadic storytellers of India. And the most amazing thing is they do exactly what you're saying. They know you, they create the story, they alter the narrative, either they sing for you or do a painting, scroll for you, or they record your genealogy because your sister in the next village needs to know what's going on. And they go to your sister and tell her about her, what is about her, you, your children, you, who you dated, whatever it might be. <laughs> but this is, I always used to think how, you know? And this is called the cultural economy. One of my friends who did a PhD said, 30% of India was driven by cultural economy. Okay, do you know where I'm going? Exactly, and I didn't know how it would happen. And you said the same, you know, now I can see everybody in a village can create a story, like from this trust network that I was talking about, the stories that come, it can be an AI generated story for the village, what's going on. I can see it, and and we work with NLP, how to do, you know, voice search amongst the stories, and we tag them, we we extract, and what they are now trying to do, like every most everybody, is to contextualize the generative models, right? Because it has to be come from them, not from some worldwide model, right? So that has to be refined. So it's all going towards what you're saying, yeah. Thanks, Dinesh. Dinu, what are, what are your comments? Thank you. Well, wha what I, I take away from this beautiful conversation, and thank you very much for your input and sharing, is that we can no longer keep talking with terms that are too high level. So when we're talking about accessibility, I think this example, and I can share with you my own example when I designed and implemented the digital identity for the UN, is that you, we need to start qualifying our terms. So accessibility for who? Accessibility for young people, accessibility for elder people, because each one of these categories, groups of people, have a different needs and different problems. So going back to what Gunja was saying, if we want to use the same approach that the, the Meta, the Google, the world are using, is really that we need to be specific. We need to be really at the individual level. We need to identify what are their needs. Again, my practical example. I designed the application. We were brainstorming on the utilization of sophisticated technology like a zero knowledge proof. How to implement it, what are the implications, the fact that the devices in the hands of the user may not have the adequate technology to support that. But then we realized, as you were saying, there were also a lot of people in the, our demographic that have problems seeing. They're blind. So we had to start rethinking the design of the application and imagine the use of that application by people that need assistance. And how can a biometric profile can be captured by someone who cannot see and therefore needs help? How to move the device, how to interact with the device, how to enable that support. So if I may conclude, we need to, again, go at the lower level, be more granular, and really qualify our statement by being precise with a human-centric approach that take into consideration all these different types and categories of people. 
thank you dinu i think uh, the kind of discussions yeah, that we are and, having... and uh, one one point uh, Raj, uh, professor gupta i want to just suggest sure. here just as a thought counter to your you know kind of as in addition to what you said around the usof you know imagine if you did that and you made another recommendation of something like saying that either it's whether it's universities or governments they contributed to something you know so let's say the top 5000 universities committed x dollars that went into universal literacy at scale so let's say if i'm harvard and you know i have a 35 or 50 billion dollar endowment but there are other universities who may not have that privilege maybe they have less but there's literally 10000 universities contributing x dollars per year as a as part of the commitment to turn the literacy at scale and that is used to do some of the things that we are talking about including things like annotations including things like mass personalization and of education and learning at scale because ai is here it's here to disrupt and we wanted the disruption be for good but we want to take the two million truck drivers who are going to lose their jobs because truck driving might become an autonomous vehicle uh, model how do we turn them and start to re-educate them so that they become the next upwork freelancers who are doing digital artwork for us in the future that's the question that's on my mind and i think there's a civic responsibility that the universities and the governments and of course philanthropists have to figure out how that actually gets done thanks gunjan important point i think one of the agendas for project create team which includes you as well is to reach out to those people and say that you know we have to reach a stage of full digital and financial literacy for all with an overarching theme of internet for all in fact i mean given the fact that you brought out this important point of addiction i'm just wondering are the so called celebrities actual digital drug lords you know because they're actually getting you addicted you know this is a digital addiction so they are digital drug lords of today so i mean i don't think they are celebrities but you know one of the things that i want to bring out like last month we did is we actually got uh, as one of the organization i run is health parliament we created collabs you know we got youngsters to start coding we ran a workshop with one of the tech companies to help them understand the platforms how they can start coding though we know that over a period of time will be no code or low code system but right now it is so how many people we can get to be developers and trust me this is a huge opportunity I mean, you don't need to do a formal degree to be a developer, and we need to create that. So as we go to build our project, create to the next level, I think what I always see in forums, and I'm mostly, you know, in this UN meetings, uh, sorry to say, but most of Africa or LMICs come as footnotes, good to be put on the front page of the photograph of the books and reports, but they still continue to be aid seekers. I think what they need to be is growth centers, and the key lies in making them enabled with internet, giving them opportunities that Dinesh, Dinu, uh, you know, Shauna and Gunjan talk is to get them see what they can do. Right now, they don't even know internet. Once they know, I can tell you that the kind of stuff we are talking, we would go back to be like people like Stone Age and they will have no baggage and just look at the phenomenal opportunity of internet and grow this, I think, few more times than where we are growing. So the compelling reason for us is to take internet to them. It's not yeah. just say that we want high speed. 5G should become 6G. They have nothing. So the basic thing we have to do is to create models. I think uh, I'll not wait for next year. Normally at IGA forum, we announce that next year we'll do that. The goal would be obviously the job summit made of next year, much before the IGF happens. We need to get focused on how do we create jobs globally. But the point Gunjan raised is to reach out to those big corporations that you have an obligation to make sure that these 2.6 billion people before the end of the decade are on the internet with full financial and digital literacy of how to capitalize on it. You know, that's what the opportunity is. So we are going to prepare a report and do this. And I would also encourage, I think one of the things that have been talked by everyone and which is a critical issue is the topic of mental health. You know, and internet is actually a contributor to it in many ways. Uh, in as much as people are ser searching for uh, vent or a stress buster to use and play around with the mobile phones, but everyone has. Is I would request our team at Health Parliament to create internet etiquette as a report of like, what do you do? There are people like Shauna who use, every one of us use internet for our good. In fact, I use uh, social media network. I know how to play with their algorithms. So what you see more will be shown more. 
So I, if I'm working on a project, I'll keep deliberately searching those projects and I'll spend more time, stop that, see it six times. So next time I'm shown those projects around. So you know, it, it helps me. So but most of the people may not know how to play with their algorithms for your benefit. I think as Gunjan said, that is for good. So maybe create an internet etiquette, like how much time only you need to spend. You know, you don't have to be on it every time. It's for you, you're not for it. You, know, you don't have to become their creators. You, know, you, you should consume them in a manner that grows you. So I think one of the things coming out of this session is that we need to create a model which makes internet for all a reality. I think maybe over the next quarter or so, Gunjan, you, Dinu, and others who are a part of our board, uh, you know, to help us articulate that in a very crisp manner that on one side there should be those corporations, those universities who should contribute to a fund that helps those people rise up, connect to the internet. Other is what the etiquette, if they get to connect it to internet, what they should do. You don't want them to get and start getting into entertainment part only because that's very addictive. So we have to get that through. And uh, let's discuss as we keep going. I mean, the session is not the end. I mean, it's just the start of a very interesting discussion that have come, a lot of things that have you know, uh, bought in from the point there where we started. And any uh, closing comments, Gunjan, from you on this? Yeah, no, and Professor Gupta, I think you did a good job on summarization. I think, I think we need to, as I said, you know, we need to take some actions here. You know, let's discuss that, you know, over the next months. But I think, you know, creating some sort of an initiative that we, we align people to saying, okay, how do we take, you know, digital education literacy to the next level at scale in a way that is pragmatic, practical in the modern world of where the internet and AI is today, where they we play the same games that were played by Facebook and Apple and Google, but this time around not to just merely edu entertain them, but to re-educate them, reskill them for the future of the internet and internet for all. I think there is, a, there is something there. Uh, we can define that. And I think as we collectively engage on that, that's one of the axes. Another axis is what you talked about, a couple of billion people and more who are not even on the internet. It's not about the 6G or the 7G. It's about even giving them some basics. How do we make that happen? That should be the second thread in my mind that we need to thread here to figure out, can there be a business model that, that allows and supports those who are not even on the internet? That would be the second dimension to me, the Y axis. If we address both X and Y axis, you, you, that's where you go to what I call the internet for all vision that we're laying out here. Thanks, Gunjan. Very well summed. Connie, your last part in marks. Um, I, I, I love the, what everyone has said just now. And I think that just from, from like a new perspective, we can definitely use different technologies to personalize education. And when we look in like different, how different social medias work, why are they so addictive? Because and we can kind of like impact, uh, push that into, into the learning field as well. For example, we can like gamify learning and create more interactive experiences. We could use VR, we could use AR to make learning more immersive. We can have more mobile apps to offer flexibility and also encourage peer-to-peer -peer interaction and have some, for example, AI recommendations to enhance your learning journey. And, um, and also, it's also very important to invest in education technology infrastructure. It's important to support digital literacy and encourage inclusive and innovative educational approaches so that everyone, especially uh, marginalized communities, will have access to these engaging learning opportunities online. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Dino? Yeah, from my point of view and uh, taking input from all the excellent uh, uh, contribution and suggestion, I, I think that uh, we can and uh, we should adopt the um, approach that uh, you have exemplified in your career model. And starting from a bottom-up approach, look at all these examples that have been shared today identify the common denominators, identify the systemic mechanism that are present in those examples, and extract the model that then can be used as a terms of reference. And doing this both for the process as well as for the technologies. So we talked about AI, we talked about emerging technology, we talked about blockchain, 
and start interrelating and mapping how, where, and why each of these technology can be utilized to support the model in functioning as expected. Thank you. Thanks, Jim Shana. It has been an absolute honor being here today. So thank you so much for having me. And you know, I think my parting words would be it only takes one person. If each of us listening today and each of us in this room took one person who currently today did not have access to the internet, we could change this problem. And I think if we take it a one-to-one -one answer, uh, we, you know, we could holistically change things for the better. Thanks, Anna. So this, oh yes, please Dinesh, it's people's platform. Sorry, uh, now that you said about the, uh, how to kind of uh, uh, work on solutions. So we do an annual ant hill hacks. Every location is like an ant hill, but it's very complicated. So we bring urban and the local and the artist and the technical and all that to see what we can do for that location. It's every December, it's called ant hill hacks. And it's kind of on in line with all what you all said just now. So it reminded me of that. Yeah. Thank you, Dinesh. Uh, so as you see, we have some of the action points that have emerged. What we need to do is first, I mean, those who are interested to make sure that people used to get, you know, jobs for tech, educate to, you know, serve the tech industry, get jobs. Let's use tech for jobs. You know, let's create internet for all, jobs for all. It's possible. I mean, I think we have extensive research. The team is working. I would encourage you to look at our website, project create.tech. Join us. I think let's make a place a better world. And tech is here for good. I mean, let's not fear it. Work with it. I encourage you to join Project Create. And let's grow this together. Let's make this world a better place with tech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the. You know, thank you so much. <laughs>